right. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors. My name is Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. Hello. And today, so we're recording this on March 22nd, 2023, and uh, exactly at the same time as the Fed has made their announcement um, on the heels of the the some banks failing, were they going to raise rates, were they not going to raise rates, um, and, and they ended up raising rates by a quarter of a, a percent. Um, you know, I think originally they were telling people that it was going to be a half of a percent, and then a week ago we saw Silicon Valley Bank go under, we saw Credit Suisse go under, um, you know, a few others have faltered a little bit. But uh, uh, timing-wise, this is a fun one because on uh, a couple days ago, an episode that we recorded in February about where to put your cash savings was released. And one of the first things we talk about is, oh, put your money in an FDIC-insured bank account because it's safe. And then we saw banks fail. Um, Fortunately, all the depositors have been made whole, even above the FDIC-insured limit in the U.S. system. You know, the the Fed stepped in to to make sure everyone was protected at Silicon Valley Bank and, and the depositors got their money out. Investors, not in the same case, but anyone who had a just cash in a bank account was, was safe. Um, so we can talk more whether or not that might set a precedent for the future, but um, funny timing. So we figured today it would be fun to dive into what causes banks to fail because it's happened throughout history, hasn't really happened in a while. We, we saw a number of them fail in, in uh, the wake of 2008 with the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, but, you know, there's several different reasons that it can happen uh, from, you know, bad management, bad investments, to just the, the good old fashioned bank run, which are, are an interesting one in and of themselves. But uh, let's maybe look at some examples, Rochelle. Yeah, I think the biggest one that's been in the news lately, or at least at the time of this recording, hopefully nothing crazy happens after this, but Silicon Valley Bank is definitely the one that's been in the news the most. There's obviously several others that have been in the news as well, but it was kind of a classic run on the bank situation where, you know, there were some concerns about the bank. There were some tech companies that started pulling some of their money out because they weren't quite as strong as they needed to be and they needed some of their cash which led to, there was also an issue where like deposits weren't posting properly and then rumors started to spread and there were some rumors online, there's social media, there's all of these kinds of things where people started being like, ooh, maybe we should pull our money out of Silicon Valley Bank. And then people started doing that repeatedly. Um, And that's, that's a big deal for a bank. You know, so when you are a bank, you start with having money on hand in deposit accounts, so checking, savings accounts, and things like that. You don't just sit on that money and keep it in your bank. It's not like it's back in a vault. That's not how it works. So banks have to keep at least 10% of those balances, um, but the rest of it, they can invest, they can lend it. That's how you get a mortgage. That's how you get an auto loan. So the money that you are borrowing is coming from someone else very likely that has deposited that money. And then the bank gets to charge interest on it and that's how they potentially make money. But the other kinds of things that they're investing in is also things like bonds. So US treasury bonds, which are very, very stable usually, um, all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, they don't just have a bunch of cash sitting around so that if everyone tries to come and withdraw their money at the same time, they can just do that. They can't. And so that's what becomes a big issue. And it's part of the reason that FDIC insurance is so, so important, because if something like this happens, you want to make sure there's some sort of backup system in place to make sure that people are made whole again. Um, yeah, the, the banking system. And for some people, this is news to them that, wait, the bank doesn't actually keep my money at the bank. No, they, they haven't. And and for, for a very long time, that's not how banks work. Like if, if the banks kept 100% of their deposits in a vault, you wouldn't be able to get a mortgage. You wouldn't be able to get a car loan. Like you wouldn't be able to get any type of, of banking instrument because they wouldn't be able to like they wouldn't have any money to lend out if they had to keep all the money, you know, uh, you know, the, the depositors had in there. And, you know, it's, you know, other analogies, it's like if everyone in town showed up to the ER at the same day for medical treatment, like the, the hospital would, would break. It wouldn't, it can't serve everyone. Or if everyone with a gym membership decided to show up at the gym at the same time, it would be chaos. It, 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 it's not designed that way. 
you know, if we want to just continue to beat the analogies into the ground, like if everyone decided to order Domino's pizza the same day, Domino's would run out of pizza. And on July 11th, if everyone went to 7-Eleven to get their free Slurpee, 7-Eleven would run out of Slurpees by 9 a.m. Like it's and the one person who works there would be very overwhelmed. Like this, the system is not designed to have everyone use it at the same time. Um, it, it, it's just, it's just not made that way. So, um, I think there have been a lot of, or a lot of talk lately. And I think there's always a lot of talk after something like this happens where it's like, oh, can we point to the cause? Can we fix it? So it doesn't happen again. So there's been a lot of arguments about how there should be tighter controls on banks. We should make sure that, you know, they have higher deposit requirements or they're not allowed to necessarily keep a bunch of assets in their accounts above FDIC insurance limits. But, you know, there's always this classic trade-off where it's the same thing for us. Like if we have emergency reserves and we put it in a savings account, sure, we can learn earn a little bit of interest and our financial plan is a little bit more secure, a little bit more protected from risk because we have that money in a savings account. But that means we can't invest it. That means, you know, if we're sitting on it, in, in an account, we can't buy a house with that money. Like maybe we have buy a house with a different money, but there's all these things that we can't do. There's this opportunity cost and banks are dealing with the same thing. Um, I think one important thing to note is that the government kind of swooped in and helped out a lot of these depositors and things like that. When the government does have to do that, it's very costly. It costs a lot of money to do that. Um, but it's almost a necessary because if the government doesn't come in and kind of make sure that people are made whole again, then people become concerned about all of these other banks that maybe are in similar situations. And you have this domino effect where that bank failed. So now this bank is going to fail. And now this bank is going to fail. And it's just that overall would be very, very challenging for the economy. So there's a lot of intervention that happens to make sure that doesn't happen. We definitely saw that in 2008. Yeah, I mean, we'll never know, thankfully, but uh, if the government didn't step in over the weekend after Silicon Valley Bank in a day went under, like I think there probably would have been a cascading effect across a number of other banks, but I think that definitely helped shore up confidence in the system. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there, there's questions of, oh, should, should the FDIC limits now be raised? Because FDIC, it's an insurance fund. Banks all pay into... Um, you know, they pay dues into the FDIC that goes to insure depositors. Like they have to pay money. Uh, I think the limit used to be a hundred thousand, um, and then it was raised to two fifty. So now they're saying, oh, maybe it should be higher. Who knows? But um, you know, there's a chance that the government might have set a precedent here by bailing out people above and beyond the FDIC limits. Um, which you know, like, why should the depositors be the ones who suffer? Like, it's not their fault. But um, but yeah, so so time will tell on that one. But um, like you know, and this is just my opinion. But like in in Silicon Valley Bank's case, like I don't, it wasn't like an example of a poorly run bank. I mean, we'll talk about Credit Credit Suisse here in a second, which is a different story. But I mean, sure, you could argue that maybe their their cash could have been managed better. Their balance sheet was a little, um, you know, a bit of an outlier compared to some of the other, you know peer banks, but at the same time, they're an outlier. Like they had a specific set of customers that they dealt with, you know, basically tech startups and and, and, and tech, you know, companies in Silicon Valley. It, it's a kind of a unique niche market um, that, that they operated in. So it makes sense that they might've been a little bit of an outlier. And, but this, this could have happened to any bank. This is like purely bad luck and being on the wrong end of the rumor mill. You know, once it got started, it spread like wildfire and there's really nothing that could be done to stop it. I think part of, um, in hindsight, you know, it's always, it's a lot easier to explain and point to flaws in hindsight, but in the moment it's, it's, you know, in real time, you don't really know how things are going to play out until the future unfolds. So like during the pandemic, their cash on hand increased substantially because so much money poured in to tech funds, like so much capital was raised for tech startups. We saw like record number of IPOs in 2020, 2021. Um, and, and, and so Silicon Valley Bank flush with cash, sitting on a bunch of cash. What do we do with this? Do we just sit on it where interest rates are 
you know, it's not going to do us any good just sitting in our vault. We're going to lose money to inflation. So let's invest it. And they were relatively prudent with their investments. They put them in treasuries and high quality mortgage backed bonds. At the time, though, treasuries were paying like 1% interest. Mortgage backed bonds, when mortgages are at 3%, aren't paying much interest. Um, you know, compared to today, it, you know, those don't look like very attractive investments. At the time, though, there weren't a lot of many other safe options that gave you much interest. So, um, you know, fast forward to, you know, trying to meet redemption requests uh, in, in mid March, if they had to sell those investments in order to generate cash for their depositors, they would have had to take massive losses. Uh, like, for example, if you have a treasury bond paying 1% interest and the going rate today is 5%, the, if you wanted to sell your 1% interest rate bond, you'd have to take an 80% haircut on it in order to sell it. Because why would anyone buy your 1% bond when they could just buy a new 5% bond? So if you'd have to get the price to drop by 80% in order for that 1% to now be the equivalent of 5% on the price they pay. You know, if you have a thousand dollar bond paying ten dollars a year in interest you need to sell it for two hundred dollars for that ten dollars a year in interest to be five percent of the purchase price for the new purchaser so uh, it, it just it, again hindsight's 2020 but i think it's just a, a bad luck it could have happened to any bank out there if you know rumor gets started hey this bank might be struggling people start pulling cash out like game over there's really it's i don't know what you can do in that scenario yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. There's obviously a lot that will go into figuring out exactly what happened. Like Corey and I don't know. No one really knows. So there's already a lot of talk of there's going to be, you know, an inquiry or whatever. Like we're going to do a deep dive into this and figure it out. But again, like it even looking back, if it's not clear exactly what happened, so like how how do you necessarily plan for those things ahead of time? when it's hard to know even after the fact exactly what caused it to happen. And the truth is it, it's multifaceted. It's not one thing that caused it. And, and part of it is human nature and that you just can't control for. Humans are ir irrational. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Credit Suisse, you know, the big Swiss bank, one of the largest banks in the world, um, you know, also failed recently and was acquired by UBS just last week. Um, last week when we're recording this last month when you hear this um but uh you know they've had struggles for a while now that have been highlighted in the news over the last handful of years or so um you know some losses on big investments they made leadership changes etc um it, you know, some would argue the writing was on the wall it was just a matter of time you know they had fiscal losses the last couple of years you know people started withdrawing money all you know back in 2022 obviously it escalated in the the prior week here um but you know they their stock price peaked in 2007 and even before this run on the bank if you uh in late march th their stock had fallen over 90% since their peak um i think the the short summary uh, if we're trying to look for explanations, it looks like basically in the on the heels of Silicon Valley Bank's fallout, people were wondering who's going to be next, and Credit Suisse seemed like a, the most likely target, and it basically became a self-fulfilling prophecy where investors are like, well, I don't want to be stuck with my money over here. If they go under, so let's pull it out, and then one thing leads to another, and everyone starts pulling money out, and then the Swiss government has to step in and basically put the bank out of its misery. And then, you know, they found a suitor UBS buys them at a, you know, pennies on the dollar for, you know, cause they're still, you know, it's still a valuable asset, but, um, but not at the, you know, full price. So if you can get it at a discount and make it worthwhile. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's much more to add on that one, Rochelle, can you think of anything? No. Yep. I got nothing, but we can talk about another example. <laughs> so Washington Mutual was one of the, the many banks that failed in the, the 2008 like housing and mortgage crisis. But um, the biggest one was Washington Bank at that point. And it was like over a, a span of 10 days in the wake of Lehman Brothers failing. So there was a bank run. Um, and then JP Morgan Chase ended up buying out a lot of the assets. 
And that's why a lot of like Washington Mutual customers now bank with Chase. But the, the I think the point here is that Washington Mutual is huge. You know, they're not a little player. So it can happen to big banks. It can happen to small banks. And it can be for a variety of reasons. In the case of a lot of the banks in 2008, they just had too many bad mortgages on the books. So you had a lot of banks with adjustable rate mortgages where when the rates adjusted, people couldn't pay their mortgage payments anymore. Like that, that was the end of it. Um, so I guess this I didn't know. Corey did a little research ahead of time, but between 2008 and 2012, the FDIC closed 465 failed banks in the wave, uh, the wake of the subprime mortgage crisis. And then in the five years before that, only 10 banks had failed. So there is a huge you know, correlation between some of these macroeconomic conditions of like interest rates and all of that kind of stuff and what happens with banks too. So I think after that period of time, there were some stronger regulations that were put into place. So, so some of these like really broader things in the economy didn't happen, but it's still not perfect. Like no institution is perfect. They're constantly trying to improve it and things like that. And it's always a balance between like, what regulation is good for the economy and what regulation is too much for the economy. And no one really knows the answer to that question either. Obviously, policymakers disagree on it a lot. And, you know, there's, I don't think there's necessarily a perfect answer. Yeah. If you want to learn more about 2008, plenty of movies and documentaries. What's the one mm -hmm. with Steve Carell and Christian Big Bale? Short. The Big Short. That one's a good I mean, one. That's And that's a good book too. Yeah, Michael Lewis wrote that one. So yeah, yeah. read the book. Um, movie's entertaining. Definitely has a little bit of a Hollywood spin on it. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, they actually do a pretty good job of kind of following the events. And you know, yeah, 2008. Wait, I have to say one more thing about Big Short because it's super exciting. But in the book, Christian Bale's character, like the the guy in real life, I don't remember his name. Michael but he's Burry. A path yeah, he's a pathologist. He was there like, he started out in, in residency as a pathologist and he would be like writing this finance blog about buying stocks in the middle of the night when he was in residency. And then finally, <laughs> like quit residency to become like this crazy, like hedge fund manager, which is so, so interesting. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, I mean, sure, you could say Washington Mutual had a run on the bank over a longer span than today, you know, with Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, with the way news travels with Twitter and, and social media and everything, like like Twitter didn't exist in 2008, or if it did, it was in its infancy. Um, so you, it, like it, it, things took a little bit longer then, and we'll go even further back in time when they took even longer when you actually like you know had to you know hear from word of mouth on a by a person on the street because cell phones didn't exist. But anyways, um, like the subprime mortgage crisis, you know, like Rochelle said, you know, rates rise on adjustable rate mortgages. People can't afford to pay their mortgage. Housing prices also came down. People were underwater in their mortgages where their, their mortgage had a larger balance in their house. And some people just said, I I'm not going to keep paying this, even though I can, it's not worth it to pay for a house that's worth half what I actually bought it for. So I'm just going to walk away, let the bank foreclose on it. Sure, I'll let my credit be shot for the next seven years, but why? Why would I pay a, you know, five hundred thousand dollar mortgage when the house is only worth three hundred thousand now? Um, so, so that happened to a lot of banks. A lot of banks also invested in these mortgage-backed bonds that people were no longer paying for, so they took massive losses on those. So it was kind of an intertwined domino effect. Um, the you know the again almost five hundred banks were affected by this. Washington Mutual is just the largest of them. So they're they're kind of the poster child for it, but they weren't the only ones. Um, and, you know, a number of investment banks, Lehman Brothers, obviously, um, Bear Stearns, you know, a little bit different than your, you know, typical, you know, local bank that has branches and checking accounts and savings accounts. You know, these are larger investment banks that were also affected, um, but kind of, you know, you know, a lot of banks, you know, they have the, the direct to consumer branch and then they have the investment arm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of people were affected back in the, uh, in the 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. 10 years. But, um, yep. let's go back a hundred years prior time. to that. <laughs> yeah. I think the interesting thing is that FDIC insurance wasn't always around, you know, and, this government intervention wasn't always around. So there was a real possibility a hundred plus years ago that 
you know, you put your money in the bank and then it wasn't there. So the panic that revolved around that was very real. Like there was a possibility that you could put money in the bank. And then if something like this happened, your money just wasn't there anymore when you went back to get it. So the panic of 1907, which was well before the Great Depression, um, was also like sort of like a Great Depression, <laughs> but they called it a panic back then. And it was it was a recession at the time, but stock market had fallen about 50% from its peak and businesses were struggling a lot. And then at that point, there were numerous bank funds um, over a several week span in like October of no or November of 1907, as people kind of lost faith in financial institutions. Um, and it's kind of interesting because information traveled much more slowly back then than it does today for very obvious reasons. So you had to physically go to a bank and withdraw your money. So it, it unraveled a little bit more slowly, but it definitely did. Um, and then at that point, JP Morgan, the actual JP Morgan, not the bank itself, um, <laughs> but John D. Rockefeller, that's what I meant. John D. Rockefeller was his name. Is that right, Corey? Well, JP Morgan and John D. Rockefeller were you know, oh, both yeah, yeah, New yeah. York financiers. We've all heard of both of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they actually put their personal funds into a number of banks to shore up the New York banking system because all this basically happened in New York and then started to slowly spread around the country. But yeah, um, yeah, it's like, hey, we need to to shore this up or the whole system's going to collapse because again, they didn't have like the federal. Yep. Reserve system, FDIC insurance. Didn't, like there was no, there wasn't the government backstops that we have today. So these guys are like, hey, we need to fix this ourselves. Otherwise, and, and you know, probably selfishly, because this was their line of business. Like they needed mm -hmm. the banks to stay in in, in business. Uh, but, but like supposedly, I think I heard somewhere that like he instructed the tellers at the banks to count the money out as slow as possible. So it would slow down the run on the bank, you know, because customers are waiting in line. If it takes longer to, you know, get through each person, it's going to... Sorry, we're closed. <laughs> slow the spread. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely interesting bits of history here. Um, yeah, FDIC wasn't created until 1933 after the, the next Great Depression, um, uh, mm -hmm. following the panic of 1907. So... Um, yeah, it, you know, anytime people start losing money or, or start losing faith in the financial system, crazy things can happen. As as humans are, are emotional uh, beings, we we can sometimes act irrationally, or you know, maybe it does appear to be rational at the time. You know, like there's a, a I don't know if if it's like a chicken and the egg type of argument, but you know, do we if you feel like a bank that your money's at might be on shaky ground. Do you have faith in the system and keep your money in the bank or do you get your money out so you don't look like a fool and lose your money? You know, if you, if you leave your money in there, you could look like a fool. If you get your money out, you're participating in actively destroying that bank and putting them out of business. If other people are, you know, ultimately doing the same. So there's, what do you do? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all about people's faith in other people making rational decisions too. Like, I, I don't think it's necessarily irrational to draw out your own money if you assume that everyone else is going to do it, which they probably will. So, yeah. Yeah. I, obviously, like we talked a little bit about government intervention, which has been, you know, a big deal so far. Um, there's a few other broader implications. We talked a little bit about the Federal Reserve earlier in the episode, Um they've increased the federal funds rate repeatedly over the last year to try to bring down inflation, which as of February was still at like a 6% year over year measure since February, 2022 to February, 2023. So better, but not good. Like the federal reserves target inflation rate is at 2%, which is about what we were experiencing pre pandemic for quite a long time. And so, you know, at 6%, they still, that's not good. <laughs> That's not good for the economy. Like you get to the spiral effect where wages increase, but prices increase, but wages increase, but prices increase, and it becomes unsustainable. And so the biggest priority of the Federal Reserve right now is to decrease these interest rates. But in doing so, they have put a lot of pressure on banks. Um, and so now the Federal Reserve is looking at like, do we keep raising interest rates? Do we slow down increasing interest rates? What's what's the worst thing? Is is 
Is it worse if banks fail or is it worse if inflation continues? And there's just this very real struggle with policy decisions about what to do next. So there was a lot of speculation before the banks started to kind of go downhill that the Federal Reserve would raise interest rates by a half a percent this month. And then they slowed it down a little bit. They only did a quarter of a percent, but they still did it. You know, like I think inflation is still a very big deal and a very real concern. And so it makes sense that we're trying to get that under control. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we can have enough support for banks that it's it's okay. And people have enough faith in banks that it's okay. Yeah, it seems people still have plenty of confidence because the stock market is actually, I believe, up a little bit um, since Silicon Valley Bank's fallout. So I'd be curious if we saw you know, a, a precipitous drop in stocks if the Fed would have pumped the brakes and, and not rose, risen, raised, risen, whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. Elevated I think, rates. <laughs> yeah, I think that if they had kept increasing rates at the same level, the stock market probably would have been down. I think that maybe part of the reason it's not is because they were like, oh, the banks are in trouble. The Federal Reserve is not going to raise rates as much. That's good for us, you know? I mean, I think it also just points to people still have money. Like yeah. they're buying stock market rises because more people are buying than selling stock market falls because more people are selling than buying. So in order to have more That's buyers true. and sellers, there's got to be money that people can spend to buy. So yeah. um, we still got a pretty darn, it's a pretty strong economy. So uh, yeah, we will see what happens though as time goes on. So kind of, we've alluded to this already, but the whole banking system, the whole finance system, it really just, humans and like it all like our whole society involved revolves around trust you know it, it, the whole system we, we there has to be an element of trust in order to make it work once customers start to lose that trust they're going to bail and go somewhere else you know probably one of the best examples would be just why does currency work like a hundred dollar bill is just a piece of paper with the number 100 on it and some colorful ink like, why is it worth $100 and universally agreed that this is $100 and you can exchange it for goods and services throughout our country, throughout the world, really, and everyone accepts it for the same value? Um, and, you know, Rochelle, you were, we were talking before this, but you brought up the book Sapiens. Which I can't remember if I've read that or not, but it sounds like you know it, 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 uh, it discusses a lot of these. Um, you know, basically, our, our institutions are all essentially fiction and and we believe in them and once we stop believing them in them like the, that's the only reason why they exist and work is because we we collectively agree on this ideology once and that can change and evolve over time but Absolutely. you know we collectively agree that a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars and once we stop agreeing on that then the dollar you know is in trouble um you know and there have been uh, periods in time where, where notable currencies have failed you know, in recent history, like Germany's currency failed after World War One, Hungary's failed after World War Two. In the last 50 years, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Angola, Yugoslavia, Belarus, Zimbabwe, you know, for one reason or another, usually inflation is, is one of the biggest drivers. But what causes the inflation? It's, you know, whether it's um, trade deficits, you know, printing money to meet debt obligations, civil war, political unrest, like number of, of, of initial causes um, that people could point to, but essentially once inflation starts to rise, other currencies around the world stop accepting your currency for, for face value. Cause they, you know, you can't put a price on it really. So yeah. then like, it's not worth anything and it goes away. Yeah. You see people like trading currencies for gold sometimes. Like I'm going to hold my, you know, assets in gold because that is going to hold its value better. But gold only has value because we decided it does too. It's not a whole lot different. So it's, yeah, it's all about if we have trust in the system and the way that it's working and in all these different parts of the system too. Which I think, at least in America, the Fed has done, in my opinion, a good job of demonstrating that we can have faith in the system even when the some of the guardrails have fallen down like they've still stepped in to bail people out does that set a precedent for the future can we just always expect to get bailed out i don't know i think they always they got to keep us on our toes and keep us wondering otherwise you know we're, we're just going to expect it but um but i guess you know what what can you do one i think 
don't panic if you have money at a bank, which everyone does. <laughs> it's probably safer than having money buried in a coffee can in your backyard like people used to do. Um, you know, at the very least, if you have a high interest savings account, you'll get you know some interest and hopefully keep pace somewhat with inflation over time. But you know, I'd say the best recommendation is just keep your account balances at any institution and any account registration below 250000 because that's the FDIC insurance limit where the, the government will insure your balance per account registration up to 250000 So if you have more than $250,000 in cash, spread it across multiple accounts and, and go listen to our episode from March 20th about you know what to do with some of that excess cash because you know really for our listeners at least, there's not a ton of reasons why you'd want more than 250000 in cash just sitting in a checking account unless you know you're getting ready to write a check for a home down payment or or something um mm -hmm. but any other ideas or tips Rochelle I think that's the big thing I, my understanding is also that if your bank does collapse or whatever and you're waiting for that FDIC insurance stuff to pan out that it can take a little while um and so if you have real concerns about your bank, it may make sense to just have some deposits elsewhere that are easily accessible. Like, you know, make sure you have a separate checking account that you can pay your bills out of and things like that. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, broadly that a lot of banks are in trouble. I think that the system is is still pretty strong right now. So I doubt too many people have to worry about that. No, I mean, most banks have pretty strong balance sheets at this point in time. You could argue, yeah. you know, better balance sheets than any time in history, just given some of the rules and regulations that were imposed following 2008. And then just, you know, all the money that, and, and how strong the economy has been, you know, the, you know, there's, a, there's, most banks are in pretty good, pretty good shape. Like, like I said, even going back to Silicon Valley Bank, they weren't like, <laughs> in bad shape they weren't a bad bank people just for whatever reason started to lose some confidence and they bailed like mm -hmm. they, they, it's not like they made these awful investments that lost them a ton of money or that like it, they it, it wasn't i don't think it was poorly run or managed it's just they unlucky really is kind of what it boiled down to um, yeah. If everyone kept their money there, they would have been just fine. Like, and actually, I think I've heard. I don't know if I can confirm this. I, like, we haven't done a ton of investigative reporting, but I've heard <laughs> um, rumors that you know a lot of them are now at you know the bigger banks, and they're very frustrated at how slow things are taking and how these bigger banks aren't understanding how their business works and operates, and they're actually trying to go back to Silicon Valley Bank to you know get the service that they were accustomed to. So it's like, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, apparently. Well, uh, don't be too worried about it, probably bottom line, but it is, it's very interesting to learn more about it and see some of those broader effects too. Yep. All Thanks right. For listening. Yeah. We'll see you next time.